Wow, do we have a lot to cover today, that is for sure. Let me get my chat boards up here so I can see what you guys are saying. If you're uh, just logging in, um, make sure to smash that like button, my friends. We are going live. Make sure my camera is set correctly because we are live. <laughs> uh, we got four watching already, so I'm going to wait a little bit here before we get going. Uh, if you guys are out there watching, uh, make yourself known. Jump in the chat box and uh, join in on the chat with us. Um, so yeah, we are dropping powder and seeding bullets. And this is the last section or last episode of the live event reloading for this PSA 6.5 Grendel AR upper. It really it doesn't really matter what cartridge it is. Uh, it doesn't even matter if it's semi-automatic. You know, this obviously goes for bolt action or semi-automatic, especially if you full length for size. And if you are new to the game, this entire series should help you out tremendously. Um, so yeah, if you are out there, jump in the chat boards and join in on the conversation. Um, like I said, we are dropping powder and we are seeding bullets. And this is somewhat of the continuation of the 6.5 Grendel AR series, the PSA series. And get this target out of the way here, but we are gonna do some more low development at this 123 grain ELDs with 27.7 grains of Varget based off this low development. You know, this is right at a half minute of angle. Got a little bit of a flyer here, but these four shots here, about three eighths, got somewhat of a flyer that's still three quarter of a minute of angle. So that's still pretty darn impressive. And if you guys are just waking up this morning, you better get your coffee because this is going to be a, a long one. So we got a, a lot of bases to cover here. And like I said, I'm just going to wait a little bit longer for some more people to log in. And yeah. And let me just quick go over my powder storage. Me and that we're talking about dropping powder. And personally, what I like to do is store my powder in a metal cabinet and it's very important to make sure that that metal cabinet is not sealed you know these doors are are held in place by magnets there this isn't lockable god forbid you ever get a fire you don't want a lockable cabinet if that cabinet is locked and it's sealed and you can't open that door god forbid you ever get a fire but if that powder could bust it's going to literally turn into you know, B-O-M-B. -B. So <laughs> make sure that this isn't sealable. And I like to get my powder as low as possible. I'm in a, in Wisconsin. Most houses here in Wisconsin have a basement. I know some of you guys in other areas like Florida don't have basements, but it's best to get your powder as low as possible because obviously um, if this house was to ever start on fire, you can see I got nothing but PEX pipe running throughout my entire house. Matter of fact, my water supply line's right there. And most of the damage during a fire is actually done through water damage. It's not actually, I mean, obviously a fire is going to do a tremendous amount of damage, but that water damage comes in the boot. And if we ever, if I ever did get a fire in my house, God forbid, this is going to turn into a water sprinkler. And this basement is most likely going to turn somewhat into a swimming pool and if i can keep this powder as low as possible that i guess can be the best situation and i don't use a dehumidifier and a lot of guys use dehumidifiers in the reloading room i just personally don't um i've heard a lot of cases of fire starting because of dehumidifiers especially if you don't clean them and keep them maintained a lot of people just plug in a dehumidifier and forget about them and let them run and you know we have 
air conditioning in our house and I'm really only concerned about humidity during the summer times and the AC is running anyways and that does a good enough job of keeping the humidity out of the air. So if you get a newer house with definitely, you know, central air, I probably wouldn't even worry about a dehumidifier. And that's at least my opinion, um, especially with my dyes. I store my dyes in Ziploc bags, like I mentioned earlier, with WD-40. And there's not a speck of rust on these dyes. And heck, I even do that with my powder drop. I rarely progressively reload. Uh, but when I do, and I can see if I can get this out here. I do have my powder drop in here, and even my powder drop, I store that powder drop, at least the bottom section of it, in a Ziploc bag, and it's literally doused with WD-40 in there. And this has been in there, I'm going to guess this powder drop has been in there. You can see there's not a speck of rust on that thing. I bet this powder drop has been in there, <laughs> I haven't touched this thing for well over a year and a half, almost two years I bet. And that Ziploc bag with WD-40 really does a good trick in regards to keeping the rust off your reloading equipment. So let me see who's logging in here. Camp Cam 413 is just logging in. Good morning, everybody. Yes, it's a great way to start out the morning. And I'm sure some of you guys are essential workers and you're actually working throughout this COVID BS and good for you guys i mean it's it's good to have those essential works to keep our economy and our nation going as a whole god forbid this turns into a, a worse situation but hopefully this will just pass within a month and it'll just be nothing but a memory something you can tell your grandchildren so uh like i said if you're out there jump in the chat boards and let yourself be known so we are dropping powder and seeding bullets here. And I think we're just gonna get going. So um, first and foremost, let's talk about powder scales, means of dropping powder. Now, I use two charge masters and I do this to speed up the process, especially if I'm reloading a vast quantity of brass. Usually if it's 50 pieces or less, I just usually use one powder drop. But you know, if I'm using, if I'm dropping 100 or plus uh, cartridges and I'm not using the progressive nature with a powder drop, I'll just use my two charge masters. And in my opinion, now this is just my opinion, I, at a bare minimum, regardless of what you can afford or not, if you're going for precision reloads, at a very bare minimum, I would at least get an RCBS charge master um, at a bare minimum. And they're not exactly cheap. If you're buying all your reloading equipment, to do it right, I think you gotta spend at least a minimum of roughly $1,200. And that is a bare minimum. And one section of that $1,200 is gonna be damn near $300 of an RCBS charge master. I mean, yeah, you can use an old analog style power scale, and that's fine. Everyone's got a different method of man. This is just my opinion. But in my opinion, it just takes way too damn long. And if you got the time, that's great. But in regards to electronic powder drop, in my opinion, the bare minimum would be the RCBS. Uh, good old Eagle Eye shootings rolling in. Good morning. Um, yeah, so Eagle Eye Shoes, any experience or positive feedback on the FA IntelliDropper? And that's a good point. And I actually have that information already loaded up on my screen here. I'm about to go over that here very soon. I've actually got more information above and beyond that. Um, matter of fact, why don't we just talk about that right now? So let me get you up close and personal. Now, like I said, at a bare minimum, I would use an RCBS. If you get them at a good deal, you can use them, get them around 300 bucks, maybe a little over that, 350. A lot of times they run these with a rebate, so keep an eye out for that on RCBS website. Um, I wanna say I got these on sale for 275, which is a pretty smoking good deal. Um, and that would be the bare minimum I would get. I wouldn't get anything less than that. Now, if you want an, a step up from that, 
I would suggest getting the AMD FX120i. Now that's just the scale. Um, this company here, which is the Auto Trickler V3, um, that actually comes with not only this scale, now keep in mind, look at the price of the scale. This is off Amazon. That's just the scale at pretty much $750 shipped. You can also get this from this company, which is autotrickler.com, and they have the, their version three, and there's several other companies that sell similar packages like this with the uh, auto drop and the uh, hopper that drops the powder. And they, I don't know if they have the price on here or not. Let me see if they got a price on this. So just for the additions for the, the auto trickler and auto throw, it's another roughly $500 above and beyond the scale itself. So, um, let's see, it's been a while since I looked at that, but they have accessories, accessory kits, the auto throw, the auto trickler. You can buy those individually too. Um, and there's, like I said, there's other companies that sell similar packages to this, but if you want an upgrade to the RCBS, this is probably the route I would go. And this is accurate, I believe, to 0 0.02 grains of powder, where this, the powder uh, charge masters, which you're, I'm gonna show you here pretty soon, is accurate within 0 0.1 grains of powder. So, this would definitely be an upgrade from the RCBS for sure. And like I said, there's other companies that sell similar packages to this. And you can see even uh, good old Gavin Tube did a, a video on this because you could definitely run over his channel and check this out if, if you're looking at this particular package. Um, and I would love to actually get this. And like I said, this is accurate. I believe they say 0 0.0. No, that's... I think it's 0.02, I don't know, I can't remember, but it's very much more accurate than RCBS. And I would love to get this, but for right now, the Charge Masters are serving their purpose and I'm I'm happy with them and I probably won't upgrade. Uh, you know, it's, it gets to the point of like how anal and how accurate you wanna get. And like I said, yeah, I could, I could upgrade my press to a Dillon. I would like to do that. And I'd like to upgrade my powder scales. And that's probably the next things I will do. But in order to do that, I'm probably going to be looking at another 2000 bucks. And am I going to get that return right away? I don't, yeah, I would definitely see an increase in accuracy and a little bit easier function and use for the press. But Man, I just don't know if I can justify $2,000. And like I said before, you want to buy the absolute best equipment that you can afford and uh, meets your purpose. Now, with that all said, if you want the very best of the best, you're probably going to want to look at a Prometheus. Now, they don't give these away. You can buy lease or lease buyout and you can see how ridiculously expensive the Prometheus is. This is the cream of the crop. And if you want the best of the best, this is not accurate to the grain. It is accurate to the kernel. They actually say that here. Accurate to the kernel. These guys don't screw around. But like I said, in regards to pricing, this is expense it exponentially <laughs> north of the charge master exponentially north of that and it's even well north of the ad fx 120i and you know i know a couple guys that have it and they say it's amazing but it's crazy expensive and this is kind of what it looks like if you're not familiar with what the prometheus is let me see if i can get you a little bit closer here so it is an, a humongous machine and it's been out for a while actually, but it is insanely accurate and it's insanely fast and it is the best of the best if you want, if you're looking at powder scales. 
but they don't exactly give that away. So those are your three options in regards to powder drops. If you're just getting into buying your equipment for your reloading room or just getting into reloading in general, those are my three main picks in regards to um, powder drops, powder scales. So let me read some of your comments here. So Jair Bear Tactical is just rolling in saying, good morning, Todd. How are you today? I'm doing really good. Thanks for joining us, my friend. Um, and just like Eagle Eye Shooting just says, Charge Master does just fine for what we do. And you're exactly right. And that's, I just don't feel the need to upgrade for, from the Charge Masters. And they work just fine, especially if you can get a good deal on them for what's in a blue moon. You might see it in the middle 200s. Uh, on average, they're about 300 to 350 ish, somewhere around there. And if you can keep an eye out for RCBS rebates, you can get them pretty darn cheap. Um, Jer Bear texting, God damn, for that price, I better send a human with it to reload my ammo. <laughs> That's no joke. They don't screw around with those, that Prometheus. But like I said, Charge Master. The auto trickler for A, A and D that's, or the Prometheus. Those are the top three, in my opinion. You can see how it exponentially ramps up in price. So, uh, so yeah, if you are just joining us, we are dropping powder and seeding bolts. This will be the last episode of this live event. And I just made a playlist of this. So if you are new and want to go back and watch those videos from start, or if you have a friend or family member that's just getting into reloading you know hey what you know what you should go check out elster's rifles and reloading he actually started a playlist with a live event and what's nice about these live events is a lot of you guys are new and you're asking those questions that other people might ask themselves and they can go back and watch this from start to finish and when we get done with this in part eight i'm going to add this and this series will be done actually won't be truly done. I'm gonna take those reloads out to the uh, rifle range and we're gonna shoot them and see how they perform. Um, and that will truly finish off the series and I think it'll make it pretty damn uh, epic in regards to a reloading series. So um, so yeah, let's uh, get this going. So I'm gonna re reloading Varget and I'm just gonna quick touch base with this again. Um, if, If you guys do not know what I'm talking about, this is somewhat of a continuation of my PSA 6.5 Grendel firearm series. And in the very last episode here in part five, we did this load development. And it's kind of a continuation of the part five of the series, the Palmetto State Armory 6.5 Grendel PSA review. And if you haven't seen this, it is an awesome series. It's in my playlist area to boot. Um, now, when it comes to setting up your scale, at least what I do, let me get you guys situated here. Make sure this is all in the screen. Now, first things first, when it comes to at least the Charge Master, really any other scale, but in this particular example, the Charge Master, first things first, you wanna make sure this is level. So we got this, you know, marginally level, and also you wanna make sure it's not wobbling. There's adjustable feet on the bottom, so you can adjust these feet. Uh, so this doesn't wobble. Also, I like to use dryer sheets, the bane of these scales or charge masters in general is static electricity. And you can actually see I have a dryer sheet. Dryer sheets are your friend in regards to the powder drop <laughs> community. And what I like to do is at least take out my pan and I will wipe down my pan with a dryer sheet. I'll actually take this part out and I'll wipe this down, make sure my scale's generally clean, and I'll actually put this right back under. And it helps eliminate some of that static electricity, and that helps keep the uh, scale from drifting. And I like to personally keep my weights out of 
my scale when I'm dropping powder. And you definitely want to, at least what I like to do, is put the weight of my pan in, in regards to grain weight. You can see this, it says 148.0. Let's see if I can get this in the picture here. And that tells me how heavy my pan is. And you're gonna see that here in a little bit. If I put this on here, it says 148.0. Make sure you guys can see that on the screen. It looks like you can. And when I zero out this pan and I drop my powder, and you can see when I remove the pan, it shows negative 148.0. And there's a thing called drifting. If you're not familiar with, uh, you're new to reloading, you're not familiar with these uh, scales. There's something called drifting, especially if you do an extremely long reloading event, you're doing 100 plus pieces, you can actually see your scale drifting in regards to uh, the grain weight of the pan itself. And you might start to see 147.9, and then you might see 147.8, and 147.7. It's drifting off of the true weight of what your scale should be once it's zeroed out. And that's something you definitely need to keep an eye on. And it does happen, especially like I said, in really long reloading events, you gotta keep an eye out for drifting. And that's why I put the weight of the pan. You can see I actually have obviously two charge masters here. And I actually label those two. So I don't get them confused. This is called, I just call it any name, but I just call this white. And that's because this has a white big pen insert which i'm going to go over here pretty soon with a mcdonald's straw mod and also mr blue oops that's the pan dropping off here and that's because this one has a blue pen insert and that's the only reason why i call them those names because of the pen mod insert so while i'm going over the pen mod inserts if you're not familiar with charge masters i have a mcdonald's straw mod a lot of guys will will put in a mcdonald's straw mod in my opinion that's not precise enough i get way too many overthrows even with the mcdonald's straw mod and all that is a little chunk of mcdonald's uh, straw shoved inside the trickler of the rcbs charge master I actually put a little bit of blues paint entertainment in there. Just make sure it holds it in the place so it doesn't slide in and out, especially with these pot pen mods. And then what I like to do is actually get a big pen, the tip of a big pen. So let me see if I can focus in on this. So all this is is the tip of a big pen. And then I took a drill bit. Let me see if I can focus in on this for you guys. So I took a big pen tip and I took a drill bit and I kind of slightly beveled the mouth opening of this big pen tip so it's kind of beveled here so it's easy for the powder to enter inside this big pen tip and then I carefully cut up some blue painters tape and I wrapped it around at least this section of the big pen tip and the reason why I put that blues painter tape on there is I strategically wrapped enough tape around there so when I slide this into the McDonald's straw mod, it's it's snug, but it's not ultra tight, I, so I can remove this. And the reason why I do that is when I'm done with my reloading powder drop session, I will, in order to empty this RCBS Charge Master quick, I will remove this big pen insert and obviously that opens up the throw opening of the trickler and I can empty this with empty the powder really, really quick for storage purposes when I'm done dropping powder. And what this does, this Big Pen mod, is it slides inside that McDonald's straw mod just like that, and it reduces the mouth opening of the RCBS Charge Master. And it's pretty pretty rare. I, I've no, I have noticed that Mr. White here is a lot more accurate in regards to Mr. Blue. I don't know why, I've tried to home Mr. Blue down as accurate as Mr. White, but this, this RCBS Charge Master with this white big pen insert is pretty damn accurate and it's pretty rare to get overthrows. And if I do get overthrows, you can see I have 
a plastic spoon here. And I've actually filed down the tip of this spoon to a razor sharp point. I mean, it is razor sharp. And you could probably cut yourself with this thing. And if I do get any overthrows, I can, I can scoop out a little bit of powder and I'll drop, drop it back in the hopper here. Um, and that does happen once in a while. Um, and that's where, you know, powder scales like the A and D, and especially the Prometheus, that's where it's pretty rare you're ever gonna get um, powder drops. And like I said, you can see that the RCBS is accurate within 0 0.1, 0 0.1 grains of powder. I believe the A and D is accurate to 0 0.02. And the Prometheus, what at least what they're balking about, is they're accurate not only to the grain weight, but they're accurate to the literal kernel of powder. So, um, yeah, that's how awesome that is. So let me just read some of your comments, make sure I'm not missing anyone's uh, comments here. Um, Eagle Eye Shooting, wondering on your thoughts on seeding dyes and if you found concentricity to play effect and accuracy in Concentricity in regards to making sure your bullet is seated as straight as an arrow in regards in relationship to your brass. It's definitely important. And I personally don't do it. It's another one of those things. It just depends on how accurate you want to make your ammunition. And it is important. Don't get me wrong. And I, I, I should be doing it. Do I do it? I don't. I just like, like I said, I'm a weekend warrior on steroids. I just knows a little too much <laughs> um, and it's definitely a good thing to do and if you have the time i would do it um you're probably going to see more improvement with a bolt action than you would with a semi-auto you got to think about in regards to semi-automatic you're loading up that magazine and at least with an ar every firearm is different in regards to semi-automatics but at least with an ar the most typical situation you're loading up that mag and that round is literally for, forcibly getting stripped off that mag and it's running up the ramps getting slammed into the in the chamber i mean if you use something to fix the concentricity of the bullet in regards to how straight that bullet is seated into the casing i mean is it going to go to hell anyway you know i and i don't crimp I just don't think I would see that much of an improvement. And I think my results show that. Um, I wouldn't say I'm the most accurate shooter. My reloads are the most accurate. It just depends on how much time you want to put into it. Now with a bolt action, and especially if you single feed, if you're something like a bench rest rifle shooter, you have to do that. It's, it's, you have to. Your bench rest rifle shooter, your competition, your single feeding, your rounds, uh, you're to the point where you're not even really shooting the damn rifle. It's sitting in a, a rest and you're, it's like these guys got these rifles so set up to the point where they don't even really shoot it other than making sure it's on target. Um, you, you really need to do that. And I think it's imperative that you do do that. And it's a good question. Um, but for me, just as a weekend warrior, I just don't find it necessary. And my results are good enough, at least for me and my purposes and my expectations. So Thor's Axe is rolling. He's saying, hey, Todd, and good morning, my friend. I hope you're enjoying your morning. And uh, let's keep the ball rolling here. So some other things that we, I have to talk about here before we drop powder is making sure that you give your scales time to warm up. And it's really important to make sure that you're allowing at least 10 to 15 minutes for your scales to warm up before you use them. If you don't, if you just turn on your scales right out of the gate and you just start using them right away, you, your, your drops might be a little off. And it's important to make sure, regardless of the electronic scale that you're using, that's where analog really shines, is make sure that you allow your scales to warm up properly before you use them. Now, another thing too, especially if you're using stainless steel media, and I've, I kind of touched base with this in the last video, and I have this flashlight here, but it's really important just to do a quick inspection. I would do this regardless if you are 
using stainless steel media or not. And I will just quick inspect these for two things. And one, I'm looking to make sure a primer is seated. You can physically see the primer seated through that flash hole. And then also what I'm looking for, if I was to use stainless, me st blah, blah, stainless steel media, which I don't anymore, and that is for stainless steel pins. And the last thing, and I have literally once in all my years of using stainless steel media, I did catch a pin one time. It was stuck right at the bottom of the neck. And I did catch that. And God, man, if that powder was an ignite, God knows what would have happened. Most likely the pin would just go right out the barrel. Might screw up my rifling a little bit. But you never know, it very well could have exploded and it would have been a, been a bad situation. So it doesn't take long to do this. I'll just quickly verify all my casings are completely empty and the primers are seated. And that definitely doesn't hurt. It's just an extra safety precaution. So Jason Lopez is rolling in the house saying good morning. Good morning back to you. Uh, Red Pill, YouTube strikes channels for showing this. So yeah. Um, I don't know. <laughs> so anyway, uh, all right. So let's keep on going here. And we are using Varget. And when it comes to powders, my main three, and I kind of touched base with this before, is Hodgkin's H4350, XBR8208, and I usually use XBR8208 for short barrel rifles. Um, it's a faster burning powder in comparison to something like Varget and, and uh, H4350. And if you got a short barrel um, SBR or a short barrel anything with a pistol brace, uh, a big fan of the XBR8208. Uh, it's faster burning, you get less fireballs, more of the powder burns before it, that bullet exits the muzzle. Um, and that's why I use that a lot for, especially like my 10 and a half inch 223 AR pistol uh, with 55 grain VMAX bullets. Man, it's insanely accurate. Good uh, pet load there. For my six millimeter pills, 6.5, like 6.5 um, Creedmoor, uh, six, mil, mil, six millimeter pills with a 243. I'm usually using H4350 in Varget. It is actually pretty, quite rare to use Varget for um, Grendel, 6.5 Grendel, but I have so much Varget, literally, I bet I have 24 pounds of this stuff, um, that it's very, it's not affected by temper, temperature much. That's why I'm a huge fan of H4350 and Varget is they're not affected by temperature much. So if you were to reload in the middle of summer and you, you've perfected that pet load, and then you went on to, for example, um, in the middle of winter and you're shooting those same pet loads, your feet per second or velocities might change because you're using a powder that is very sensitive to temperature. So it's important to keep an eye on that when you're selecting your powder. So. Uh, so Kyle Almatic said, I found the hybrid V100 shoots the 6.5 Grendel and Creedmoor both. And that's awesome. And it's just, it's just trying to hunt down what works for you and what's available, at least right now. Uh, powder in general is next to impossible to get right now, especially the top five. So, uh, if you guys are watching, don't forget to smash those, that like button, subscribe, like, and share. But Let's um, drop some Varget powder inside this Charge Master, Mr. White. I'll try and get the best angle here for you guys so you guys can see what the heck's going on. So we got the Varget. I'm gonna make sure that the side here is closed so powder doesn't spill out on my bench. And trust me, I've done that before. All right, so you got some Varget powder in there. And 
Next thing we need to do is calibrate the scale. So if you guys are new to the game, you're just watching. Uh, so I'm gonna zero this out. And then I'm gonna hit calibrate once, at least on the charge master. Hit it once again. It's gonna ask for the 50 gram. These aren't grains, these are grams. So 50 gram weight, so I'm gonna put one in here. And I'm gonna wait till it says stable. There's a little stable mark right there. Let me see if I can get that a little bit closer for you guys so you can see this for those that are absolutely new. <clears throat> so you can see it says stable right there. So we got that. And then I'm gonna hit calibrate again. That's gonna ask for 100 total. So I'm gonna grab the other 50 gra gram. Wait, wait till it says stable and hit calculate again. Now, one thing you don't want is a fan blowing. You don't want any air blowing on this, a slight breeze. I'll show you this in a little bit. It will affect it. So I'm gonna remove this until it says 50. And then remove this one until it zeroes out. Now it's calibrated and I'm gonna hit zero again and you're gonna see my be, my by me just blowing on this scale, you can see it affects that. So make sure you don't have a, fl a fan blowing on. It's middle of summer and you're hot, you, got, you wanna have a fan blowing on you. Make sure it's not pointing towards your, your powder scale. So now this is calibrated and is zeroed out and I'm gonna put this pan on and I know this pan weighs 148 grains. So I'm gonna put this on and it should say 148, and I'm gonna hit zero. And now it's calibrated and is ready to drop powder. And if you are curious, in this example, we are dropping 27.7 grains of Varget. And if you wanna get an idea, So one pound of powder equals 7,000 total grains. So if I have one pound of powder, there's 7,000 total grains in a pound. Well, we're dropping 27.7 total grains. So that means out of that one pound, I'm gonna get 252 total drops out of that one pound. If I'm using an eight pound bucket, I can times that by eight. That means I'm going to get 2,021 total drops out of that eight pound jug. And that's how you figure that out. That's also how you figure out how much your rounds are costing you. Uh, for example, uh, this eight pound jug, I got this at, this was, a, I think, 195 bucks is what I got it for. So 195 and we divide that by eight so we know how much I was paying. We'll just say $25. Say that you got a, a one pound jug for $25. And we paid, we're gonna get 252 drops out of each pound. That means each charge weight is gonna cost me 0 0.099 cents per drop. We'll just say 10 cents. Well, if each, each drop is gonna cost me 10 cents, well, these bullets, I know, I, I can't remember what I paid for this. We'll just say for pure example's sake, we paid, um, I don't know, I think I paid $26 for 100 pieces. Um, so obviously, if uh, we got, those are gonna cost you 26 cents each. And the powder drop, it was costing us 10 cents. So we're gonna add 10 and your brass. And then the brass is all dependent on how many total drops, you, uh, how many total reloads you can get out of your brass. Um, but for pure example's sake, uh, say like you bought, we're up to 36 cents so far. So say like you bought a hundred pieces of brand new Hornady brass. I'm just throwing out numbers here. Um, I don't know, roughly 35 bucks. I think they are for a hundred. Well, that's 35 per piece on the brass, but say like you get roughly 
I don't know, six reloads out of it. So you're only going to pay roughly six cents a piece. So six cents plus the 36, did I say? Um, plus a three cent primer. So roughly 45 cents per round times, you know, usually 20 pieces in a box. So those reloads are costing me nine bucks for 20 total reloads or one box. You know, I think when I bought this Hornady Black ammunition, this cost me, I think it was with tax, $23. And, you know, general rule of thumb is, is reloads in, in the precision world. Your reloaded ammunition, depending on how many total reloads you can get out of that brass, if you can get, you know, range brass, that would definitely drop that considerably. You got to be careful with range brass because someone else is dropping that brass. You don't know how many fires that's on. A lot of times when I'm out to the range, if I know I'm not going to use that brass ever again because it's been fired way, way too many times and that's the last time I'm going to reload it, and I'm on the run and gun, I will let that brass drop on the ground and I don't pick it up. And if you were to pick up that brass, those reloads are on their last leg and you might reload that and it might have considerable case head separation. So you definitely need to be careful with range pick brass. Um, but hopefully that helps you guys out in regards to how much um, uh, your reloads are gonna cost. Eagle Eye Shooting saying it's not a big pen cap. Uh, Jason Lopez saying, I think that was a math teacher in another life. Uh, that, that very well could have been possible. <laughs> uh, see here. Yeah, old Eagle Eye saying, I forgot about the drain plug on the side a few times. <laughs> yeah, jeez. Hey, man, you, you, this thing on the side, make sure that this thing is closed before you drop that powder. Otherwise, you're going to be cleaning up powder. Trust me, I've done that a few times. Um, so yeah, let's, um, drop some powder here. And like I said, in our reloading card here, this is all the same. So all I did is just change the date. I changed the fire from three fires to four fires, not using the 123 SMKs and XBR 8208. We are doing the 123 grain ELDs with Varget and 27.7 grains of Varget. So that's what we're going to enter in on the charge master. So we're going to enter 27.7. So you can see that on the readout here. And let me get you guys situated. And if you're about to purchase your reloading equipment, you're definitely going to need one of these uh, powder funnel. So now what I like to do is every time I drop the powder into the casing, I slightly tap this and I move on to the next piece and I move it right away. So I don't forget. Um, so we're going to hit enter. As a matter of fact, I'm going to show you guys, see if this drops right on the nuts on the first time. So we're going to hit uh, dispense. Now, the big pen insert definitely slows down the process, but it should eliminate under and over drops. And you can play around with the settings. So, 27.7. I usually tap this a little bit, make sure the kernels go inside the case belt opening. And it should start back up the second I put the empty pan on. And it definitely slows down the process, but in my opinion, it's about a wash because you don't have to pick out overthrows. And I still get overthrows once in a while with a big pen insert. Sometimes I get underthrows. And I'm going to let that stabilize. 27.7. If you play with the settings just right, 
you want it to slow down just a tad before it completely stops dropping powder. And it's, that's something you just gotta play around with and fine tune that charge master with those big pen inserts. And we'll, I'm gonna, I'm not gonna drop all this powder in front of you guys. I think I'm only gonna do about 10 here. Uh, I'll do the rest later off camera. But I just wanna show you how accurate this big pen insert is and especially how fast it is or how slow I should say it makes it. And once in a while I will get an underthrow because I got this so fine tuned to stop right at the very last second. But so far we're doing pretty good, 27.7. So I'm gonna count this one off here. One, one thousand, two, one thousand, three, one thousand, four, one thousand, five, one thousand, six, one thousand, seven, one thousand, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two. It's about 22 seconds. I don't think I gotta stop watching this thing. My phone here. Stop watch. So if you guys got any comments out there, let them rip while we're dropping powder. Thor Zach saying competitive rifle has got expensive to do. So that was 25 seconds. So, so far this has been dropping Pretty darn consistently. No under or over drops. So let's try this again. So that was 25 seconds. So Matthew was just rolling and I was saying, glad to see you doing these live events. Hope you're staying healthy. Thanks my friend, I definitely am. Life is all about enjoying life and just getting out and staying active. So that one was a considerably less, so almost 19 seconds. So we'll do this for the rest and just give you an idea on the average. And Kyle Max saying, damn, that's slow. And it is. It, the pen inserts definitely slow this down considerably, uh, but it definitely gets it more accurate. Um, if you're only doing 50 pieces, it's not that bad. And that's why I have two, two charge masters so I can lower this down. I think that was a little over 20 seconds. I forgot to hit stop. And that's why I have two of these. So rather than roughly 20 seconds, I can drop this down to 10 seconds and I can breeze right through this. So far, no under or over throws. And that's what those big pens are all about. So you don't have to use this. Uh, and it actually makes your it more accurate too. Um, so if I was to take that big pen insert out, it'd probably dramatically drop that powder rate. But like I said, one thing that annoys me more than anything. So yeah, about 15 seconds on that. So I would say somewhere between 15 and 20 seconds is what you're gonna get with that big pen insert. 
And then obviously if I'm using two, I can cut that in half. So literally I'm dropping it down to seven uh, seconds per, and I could fly right through this if I load both of these up. And I usually only do that if I'm doing a hundred pieces or more. So 27.7, so I'm only gonna do 10 here. I'm not gonna bore you guys to death with all 50 here. Now, one thing I'll definitely do when I'm done dropping, now just imagine all these are dropped. Um, I will just double check the levels of these powder, of the powder. Now, let me see if I can get this a little bit better for you guys. So I will just quick double check the powder levels, make sure they all look consistent. You can see with this Varget powder, let me see if I can get even closer. You can see with the Varget powder, that, that powder is pretty high. And I've already reloaded this at 27.7 grains of Varget with a 6.5 Grendel. And I'm actually, I get a little bit of compression. When I see that bullet, you can literally hear the powder getting compressed. You can hear the powder crunching a little bit. And if you can envision these all filled, I will double check the powder levels on all of these. Make sure they all look consistent. There's not one that has way too much or one that has way too little. Uh, once in a, you know, God forbid, you know, everyone's worried about getting too much powder in there. Getting too little powder can be just as dangerous. You can get what's called a squib load. And if you get a squib load because you didn't put enough powder in there or your machine didn't drop enough, I should say, that bullet might not completely go out the rifle's muzzle and it might get stuck in the barrel. And especially if you're rapid firing, you don't catch that right away. And when you're shooting your firearm, you should listen for squibs. Usually more times than not, it sounds different. If, you ever sh if you're ever shooting your firearm and the report when you shoot that firearm sounds different, stop, check out your firearm. There is a chance you might have a squib load. One of those rounds that might be stuck in your rifle's bore. And if you pull that trigger once again, another bullet goes down that rifle's tube, it can explode. And it's something you definitely need to keep an eye out for. And that's why I double check with a flashlight before I seat those bullets. So, uh, so let me read some of your uh, comments here. Uh, Thor is actually saying Jason in real life. That's what he does for a living. I, I'm actually an estimator by trade. I, I estimate materials for houses and commercial buildings. It's literally what I do. I steer blueprints. I literally figure every part of the house, starting from the adjustable columns in the basement to the, the beam, the foundation plate, the floor joists, the subflooring, the stairs, exterior walls, interior walls, roof trusses, Roof sheathing, fascia board, shingles and accessories, softened fascia, uh, siding accessories, millwork, interior doors, base case, right down to the lock sets on the doors. Literally figure every single part of the house. Uh, I do uh, some commercial buildings too, like uh, hotels. Um, I've done churches, big apartment buildings. I've done numerous of those. Uh, you name it, I've done it. And that's what I do for a living when I'm not teaching people how to reload and shoot rifles properly. <laughs> so, uh, Jason Lopez is saying, just purchased the RCBS light powder thrower. Haven't used it yet. Going to use it day for the first time and I going to need a big pen or McDonald's straw mod. And I have yet to use the light version of the RCBS Charge Master. Um, I've heard mixed results about it. Um, I don't know, I've never used it so I can't say good, bad or ugly, um, but I think if you're just starting out, it's probably gonna be a good option for you. And I'm not even sure if the McDonald's straw model will work for those. I've obviously have never tried it. Uh, but if there's a way that you can reduce the throw on it a little bit, you'll get less under and over throws and more precise powder drops. So it's definitely something you might wanna take a look at. Um, so Kyle Max, say I'm good with my measure and trickler. Uh, Matthew is saying any clogging 
uh, clogging experience regardless of the big pen. I've never once had my RCBS clog once and thousands and thousands of drops. I've never had it clog and I've never had the big pen insert clog, not once. And it works extremely well. Matter of fact, like I just shown you with these uh, 10 total powder drops, not a single under or overthrow. And I bet if I went all the way through, it wouldn't have that either. So, um, so Eagle Eye Shooting, I've seen people use a powder drop for most of the weight into the pan, then let the charge mesh will trickle up. It seems a lot faster. And that is a really awesome point there, my friend. And you can definitely do that. That will definitely help speed it up. Or you can get two like myself. If like if I'm if I really want to crunch through 50 pieces, or especially if I'm doing 100, I'll usually boot up the other one. And if you do do that, you're you're not you, what I'll typically do. And you might have noticed this with my funnels, is I got one funnel labeled white for Mr. White powder drop. I don't know if you guys can make that out. And I got this one labeled blue. And I will start from either end. Matter of fact, a lot of times I'll actually put them in two different uh, scales. So when I come together, these aren't hitting each other. So I'll, I'll put, for example, say like I have 100 pieces, I'll put 50 pieces in one tray, drop just that tray in white and drop the other tray in blue. Just in case one scale might happen to be drifting a little bit less than the other, at least the group size will be consistent. If it was to drift off a little bit in regards to say maybe 0.2 grains, hopefully I would catch that. But if I didn't, at least the group size would be consistent. It might impact a little bit lower, but at least I'd have a consistent group size. But if you're using, I know some guys that use freaking four of these and it's insane, at least back in the day uh, before the, um, before they came out with the A and D FX120i. So, um, so let me get this stuff cleaned up here and let's seat some of these bullets now i am going to see the eld match the 6.5 uh elds 123 grain and these are a ballistic tip and let's see if i can focus in here so these are a ballistic tip and they have a boat tail on it if you're new to the game you can see in the end it kind of angles off a little bit and that's called a boat tail if if let me show you a flat based bullet just in comparison and one of my favorite flat based for 223 or 556 is if i can find it here uh, of course i don't have any extras of that Maybe. yeah right here i think i got some yeah right here This is one of my favorite, hands down, 223 or 556 five, bullets out there, and that is the VMAX. Um, if I have a barrel of 16 inches or more, I have found with my low development that the 60 grain VMAX is insanely accurate if you have a one and eight twist and it has a barrel length of 16 inches or more. And I have this on video shooting in a, a six by five, six total five shot groups, consistently printing sub MOA with 23.8 grains of Varget and reloading to pretty much coal, recommended coal. And this is a flat base bullet. It also has a ballistic tip, but you can see if you are absolutely new to the game, not sure what a boat tail is, this has a boat tail, and you can see this doesn't. This has a flat base on it. And that is the difference between a boat tail and a flat base bullet. And I am a huge fan of these 60 grain VMAX, and I've put these up against 68 grain, 68 grain and 75 grain boat tail hollow points and i've shot these out to 100 yards so i have shot this consider consistently 
out to 600 yards and the 60 grain, believe it or not, I know this is hard to believe, but this 60 grain VMAX destroys the 68 and 75 grain boat tail hollow points. I know that goes against all logic. Uh, if, if yeah, I got a barrel of 16 inches or more with a one and eight twist, these 60 grains continuously came out on top above and beyond the 75 grain and 68 grain boat tail hollow points. Now with that said, um, my short barrel rifle, my 10 and a half inch SBR uh, 5.56 didn't exactly like these 60 grain VMAX. It actually printed better than, printed better with the 55 grain VMAX. And the 55 grain VMAX is an exact same bullet, it's just five grains less. It looks exactly the same, it's a little bit shorter. And what's insane about that is my PSA 10 and a half inch 5.56 SBR, or we'll just say pistol with a brace, um, it's got a one and seven twist. And you would think that that 10 and a half inch 5.56 AR pistol with a one and seven twist would prefer a heavier bullet. And when I say twist, if you're new to the game, for example, a one and seven twist, it it's gonna make one full revolution on the bullet. The bullet is gonna make one full revolution within seven inches of barrel. If it's a one and eight twist, it's gonna make one full revolution in eight inches of barrel. If it's a one and nine twist, that bullet's gonna make one full revolution in nine inches of barrel. One in 10, one full revolution in 10 inches of barrel. Well, the smaller the number, you'd think it'd be fast, uh, faster, but it's um, the smaller the number, the faster the bullet is twisting. It takes less amount of barrel, one in seven, one full revolution in seven inches, one in eight, one full revolution in eight inches, one in nine, one full revolution in nine inches, one in 10, one full revolution in 10 inches. The higher the number, the slower the twist rate. The lower the number, the faster the twist rate, and that's why. And usually, faster twist rates wreck, they, they shoot heavier bullets better. And that's true, especially if the barrel is 16 inches or longer. I would actually say more like 12 to 13 inches, 12 and a half inches is pretty common for an SBR. Once you start going over 12 and a half inches, you start hitting that 16 inch mark, and you know, you, know, you got a barrel that's 18, 20, 22, 24 inches. That is definitely true in regards to a faster twist rate wanting to use a heavier bullet, but that is not the case in my experience with SBRs. My 10 and a half inch 5.56, and I have the video series to prove that. If you guys go to my playlist area and I have a complete entire series on that PSA 10 and a half inch AR pistol. I'll see if I can find it here. It's actually probably one of my most popular video series to date. I think I have damn near 200,000 views on this series. Um, the PSA 10 and a half inch SBA three review series. This is a five, five, six upper with a 10 and a half inch barrel. The 55 grain VMAX apps, and it has a one and seven twist, mind you. You would think it would prefer heavier bullets, and that's why I tested it with 75 grain, 68 grain, 60 grain VMAX, and 55 grain. The 55 grain VMAX absolutely destroyed everything, especially the 75 and 68 grain boat tail hollow points. And when I say destroy, check out that video series. It's very long and it's very in depth. Um, I believe it's around the fourth, third or fourth part when we start diving into that reloading and testing out different bullet weights for an SBR like that. Like I said, you would think with a one seven twist, and that's true with longer barrels, 16, 18, 20, 24 inches, roughly. That is true. You might want to prefer a 68, 75 grain bolt tail hollow point, especially if you're shooting extreme long distances. 
But with an SBR, you're probably not gonna be shooting long distances. You're probably gonna be shooting probably 300 yards or less. Something like my 10 and a half inch 5.56. And I tested it thoroughly and the 75 and 68 grain shot like absolute horse crap. And the 55 grain VMAX absolutely destroyed it. And my theory and thinking on that is it doesn't have a long enough barrel to stabilize that heavier bullet, even though it's a one and seven twist. You gotta think about it. If that barrel is 10, 10 and a half inches, so let me punch in 10 and a half, and that's a one and seven twist, I can divide that by seven. And that means that bullet is only gonna rotate one and a half times, it's not much. Before, by time that powder ignites and that bullet starts its journey and literally jumps out of the casing, hits the rifle and lands, goes down the bore and exits the muzzle, that 10 and a half barrel, the one and seven twist, that, bar that bullet's only gonna make one and a half revolutions. And with the one and seven twist, you'd think the heavier bullets would perform better because of the twist, but that's not the case. And that's why the 55 grain absolutely destroyed it. And that video proves it to the T. And if you don't believe me, watch that series and you'll see what I'm talking about. Um, so let me jump back into your comments here, make sure I'm not missing anyone here. Uh, so Kyle Maddox says, hey, you ever notice cellular interference with your scale if your cell phone is too close to it? And when I first did my reloading um, series, I told people not to have their cell phone around, and I probably would still do that. But I'm going to be honest with you, I, I don't see an issue with it. I, I have my phone next to my scales all the time. It might have been true back in the day with older scales. I don't know. Uh, but I personally have never seen an issue with it. Um, and it probably wouldn't hurt to keep your cell phone or what really affects it is flu fluorescent lighting. It has a ballast in the fluorescent lighting. It's not good to get too close to um, your scales. So it's something to definitely keep in mind. Um, so Eagle Eye Shooting saying, I haven't though I've been using an $8 scale. <laughs> uh, let's see here, make sure I'm not missing anyone's questions. Yeah, so Eagle Eye, Eagle Eye Shooting saying, um, yeah, I haven't noticed much gain in powder accuracy. As soon as you get your bullet neck tension consistent, better results uh, will occur. And that's true. I mean, it's really all about neck tension. That's where that annealing really comes into place to get consistent neck tension. Um, An eagle eye shooting saying every detail makes a difference. Just gotta simplify what you need to do to consistently hit your mark. And like, keep on saying that word consistency and it all definitely comes into play. Um, consistent annealing means consistent headspace bumps. Consistent, consistent headspace bumps means you're gonna get a consistent trim because your trimmer most likely rides off the datum or headspace. Consistent trimming, if you do crimp, heavily affects your the amount of crimp that you do um, because the crimp is affected by the length of your brass and if your if your trim lengths are all off because everything else before that is inconsistent you're just screwing up everything you know the trim length also also affects your uh, neck tension if one piece of brass has a longer neck because it wasn't trimmed as much as the one before it you're going to have less or more neck tension and you can see it's a series of consistent events that leads to precision ammunition. And I can't stress that enough, my friends. Um, and a lot of guys, I know you guys are talking about bullets here, some bench rest rifle shooters, depending on what distance they're shooting at, sometimes you'll see at 600 yards or less, they actually will prefer a flat base bullet. So you'd be surprised how accurate a flat, flat base bullet is. And at 223, and I've shot this numerous times and I've proven it at least to myself, 
that the 60 grain VMAX was no joke. I was printing two, two and a half inch groups at 600 yards in comparison. And I think I've even had groups down to a, an inch and a half at 600 yards with the 60 grain VMAX. And this is out of a 5.5, five, actually a wild chamber, uh, 20 inch Rock River bull barrel firearm. It's, it's, it's insanely awesome and it just, time and time again destroys the 68 and 75 grain boat tail hollow points. And those are a flat base bullet out to 600 yards. Now, if wind picks up dramatically, those heavier bullets will obviously work better. And if you're trying to shoot a 5.56 five, at a thousand yards or more, you're definitely gonna need that heavier bullet. And that's where the 75 grain is gonna come into play. Some of those really heavy bullets, you can't load up into an AR. They can be only shot out of a bolt action because they're so damn long that the O drive radius or the secant radius of the bullet is actually starting to interfere with the case mouth opening. And they, you have to load them, seat them long and shoot them only out of a bolt action because they usually have one, either a bigger mag that can accommodate seating bolts at a less seating depth, or you're gonna single feed them. Uh, so you gotta be very careful with a semi-automatic that you're not using too heavy or too long of a bullet because Obviously, you restricted the magazine length. And that's something you definitely need to keep an eye on. So, uh, bu, bu, bu. so I think that is so. Jerry Bear Texting, question for you, Todd. So, you're using CCI small rifle primers in your 6.5 Grendel cases. Do you have any worries using those primers and having slam fires? And absolutely not. Um, I use CCI 400 primers in. All my semi-autos, I've never had an issue with it. I kind of touched base with this earlier in this live episode, and I can't remember when, but they do make, CCI does make um, four, five, five, six, and they, they are a little bit heavier cup, and they're more of a military grade primer um, that if you are concerned about it, and these are tremendously accurate, I would say they're just as accurate as the regular, CCI small rifle primer number 400. Um, you can definitely hook up with these and obviously other brands make, you know, uh, heavier cups. I'm just a big fan of the CCI, but I tell you, I have shot literally thousands and thousands and thousands of these out of my AR 15s and without issue. And I am, I'm not concerned about it, be honest with you. And I probably wouldn't be concerned about it, but like I said, everyone's got a different method of their madness and opinions. So, um, oh man, hit and steal. Yep, good morning, Seer. So hit and steal, CA is just rolling in the house. Same party gentlemen. Nice to have you along here. So we're up to 18 people. And if you're just joining us, we just got done dropping powder um, with the Charge Master and we're using Varget at 27. 0.7 grains of Varget. So I'm gonna carefully move this over. I can't tell you once in a very blue moon, this is where you usually dip a whole tray of freaking cases full of powder and that's really bad. So let me get this set up here. So usually, at least with my particular setup and my, my press, How's the sound, by the way? Is the sound okay? Uh, I know a couple of my previous videos, the sound wasn't the best. Um, let, me, let me back this up here a little bit. <laughs> Gates, Genie Reloads, and let's, let's see that bedhead hat off. <laughs> no way, man. This is, this is true afro right going on right now if i take this hat off the reloading room will probably explode with my hair uh, expanding at exponential rates <laughs> oh thanks for saying sound is good awesome so uh if you guys don't have press lighting by the way i'm a huge fan of press lighting especially for double checking to make sure that you can verify that your powder has been dropped into your casing i i should have done I, I added this about a year ago man i wish i would have done this earlier it is so so nice to have this press lighting 
Um, but usually what I'll do is I'll have my cases over here, I'll clip them in and manually seat that bullet and run this home. Um, and that's if you're going for the utmost precision. Obviously you can progressively use this, but I'm taking the progressive nature completely out of it. I'm turning it somewhat into a single stage. So you can see good old Gates for Junior is uh, saying stuff that I have to hide because he's using swear words. Oh <laughs> uh, man, people's, they're, they're asking me for a good good morning kiss and that ain't gonna happen. <laughs> so, anyway. uh, so I got my die here and first things first, what I'm about to do is what I do. I'm not showing you what you should do. Um, the amount of powder that you drop is completely up to you. And, but according to this Hornady book here, you always wanna reference the bullet manufacturers load data when you're considering I'm gonna make sure you guys are can see this okay, so let me spin this around here you always need to reference the bullet manufacturers recommended powder drop especially when you're starting out obviously you're gonna to want to use a chronograph if you can if you're getting to the maximums here and the ones in red are maximum and we are using the 123 grain right here, 123 grain, the ELD match. And you can actually look at the box. If you're completely new to the game, you can see the part number here of this particular bullet, which is part number 26176. I don't know if you guys can make that out. So part 26176 says once in a while they will change, even though the name of the bullet's exactly the same, they'll change the lot number or they'll change it. They'll change some of this, the radiuses or they'll change something on the particular bullet, even though it's called the name, same name. They'll change the, the bullet just ever so slightly and that part number might change. And that's something you definitely need to keep an eye out for when you're referencing your manuals. And you can actually see that part number on here. So 123 grain ELD match and that part number matches. So that's something you really need to keep an eye on, just not the name, but also check out the part number. Because as every year goes by, they update their books. In five years, I guarantee, they're probably gonna change this part number and they're gonna slightly change the bullet in regards to the bullet coefficient, whether they change the the radius of the boat tail or the secant radius, they might screw around with that. And it's gonna be so minute, you're not gonna see it to the human eye, but they might change that bullet ever so slightly and that part number will change and there will be a new manual or load data for that particular bullet that has completely different powder drops. Might even have a different coal, cartridge overall length. Might be a little bit different. So that's something you definitely need to keep an eye out for. You know, and then, if you're using something like Sierra Match Kings, you're gonna to wanna to reference their information. Obviously, their information is gonna trump everyone else. And in this situation, we are dropping Varget. So if you guys can make this out here. So we are dropping Varget and we're dropping at 27.7. So just a little bit over they're saying 27.6 will produce 2,300 feet per second. We're dropping 27.7. And I notice this Varget is getting compressed already. So if I start compressing powder, I don't like to go to the extremes of maximum. I don't mind going, getting close to maximum as long as I'm not compressing that powder. Because when the powder gets compressed, your feet per second typically goes north. And I notice at least with Varget, it's a pretty large, large granule of powder, um, stick powder. Um, we're at 27.7, so we're right between 2300 and 2400. So right, we're getting close to maximum, maximum is 28.9. And it's something you definitely need to keep an eye out for when, let me fix my tripod here. This is always something special when you're trying to do this live. Get my screen up here and make sure everything looks kosher. 
definitely want to double check those that reloading data before you drop powder and like i said what i'm about to do is what i do i'm not telling this is what you should do so uh so american reloader saying here has their sixth edition and it's new too gates jr reloading saying i have the 11th uh jerry bear tech saying i've got the word uh reloading app with some of the updated data from the 11th edition hornady manual nothing's changed for the 6.5 grendel as of yet and you always want to double check for those updated um manuals and once in a while i'll run in the shields and i'll just take one of the books off the shelf and just double check see if it's changed in comparison to the one i already have most times it it doesn't but I have seen it where it has changed. And that's something you definitely need to keep an eye out for. Um, and I know the, I do know the 6.5 Grendel did change uh, from my old book to the new one. As a matter of fact, I'm gonna show that to you right now. Um, so this is, this is the, this is a picture out of the very most recent the very most recent Hornady manual. I gotta fix my tripod here, sorry guys. Give me a second here. So this is the picture out of the most recent manual for 6.5 Grendel, at least with 123 grain ELD match. And Let me hunt down the 6.5 Grendel here. All right, so if I look at my old, now this is the eighth edition. So this is kind of an older manual. I'd say this, I think I got this around, oh, I don't know, 2016 I got this, I think. And does it have the 123 grain ELD match? I don't even think that bullet was out by then. Let me just double check. Yeah, so that bullet didn't even exist when this manual came out. So if you're new to the game, you can see that, uh, oh, sorry, that's the wrong one here. I'm looking at the wrong one. Here's 6.5 Grendel. Sorry, I was on the wrong page. 6.5 Grendel. And you can actually see their case trim length is off too. The new manual actually says 0 0.510. So that's wrong. Ma they show a maximum of 516. It's actually 520. So that definitely changed. So you can see things change. So if you're new to the game, that's definitely the case. And uh, yeah, the ELDs didn't even exist during this time. So that's something you definitely need to update from time to time as bullets change over time so let me get my screen back up here and let's heat some bullets here uh so gates jr really saying for for hardback maybe but not electronic and that's a good point and uh i really need to check that out i haven't done that yet so um uh, all right so let's get this going um so I got my cedar die in here. I reset this. I, I had this set already for this particular bullet. And I think once I get this done, I'm gonna set it and forget it. Um, so you're saying, read my last question. Which one are you talking about there, buddy? Okay, yeah, so you're talking what the book says in regards to your chronograph. And you need to, if you want the true FPS, regardless of the bullet, the, the manual, no matter what, you just need the chronograph. If I put a crimp on it, that feet per second is gonna go north. If I have more neck tension compared to a little less neck tension, that it's gonna affect my feet per second. Um, if I'm using Lake City brass and compared to some factory brass, 
it's got a little bit different case volume that's gonna affect my feet per second. So truly, the only way to truly know is just to use a chronograph. Now, do I use a chronograph? I used to back in the day, not anymore. I just don't drive myself insane with low development. Um, it's pretty rare for my low development to go over 100 rounds, maybe 150 tops. And I know some guys have got low development down to 10 rounds using, using a chronograph and looking for flat points, um, plateaus in their feet per second. Um, and that's something you can definitely do. I don't mind shooting, you know, 50 to 100 rounds of low development. I'm kind of breaking in the barrel in it regardless. And I've mentioned this before, you always wanted to at least shoot about 100 rounds down the rifle tube and look at how it's initially printing groups right out of the box. And if it's printing groups amazingly right out of the box, and then yeah, you could probably start low development right away. Um, but some firearms, especially more inexpensive firearms, something like a PSA or DPMS, or maybe even a Rock River, you you might want to look out and see how that firearm is printing groups initially. And if you're not overly impressed with how it's printing groups, it might take a couple hundred rounds for that rifling to settle in and for the groups to settle in and for the bore to settle in. And sometimes you can use uh, JB bore paste or something and lap that uh, bore to get those groups to settle down. Um, and that's something, like I said, you're usually not gonna wanna do low development right out of the gate with a new firearm. You wanna get, um, you know, maybe about 100 to 200 rounds down the bore. And that's what's really nice about the 6.5 Grendel is I can use really cheap wolf ammunition to get that barrel break-in process done before I even do reloads in comparison to use something expensive like a you know factory Hornady ammunition that costs damn near 20, 23, 22, $23 per box. Um, so like I said, before you do low development, you might, you might wanna get some rounds down that tube. Uh, but anything can affect feet per second. And if you want the true feet per second, especially if you're entering in, into a, um, a ballistics app or something like Streelock or ballistics AE, you really need to use a chronograph to lock down those numbers. Uh, but I just don't, I just, personally, I just like having a good time with the range. So, uh, so yeah, let's get this going here. So uh, I'm gonna grab one of these filled up cases and I'm gonna quickly inspect, make sure I got powder in there. I'm gonna clip this in, be careful I don't drop any powder. And right now we're loading for an AR and I'm just, I would recommend, I would recommend checking out your initial bullet seating depth using an overall length case gauge, even with a semi-automatic to make sure you're not remotely close to the rifling's lands in a semi-automatic. And I can't show that to you live because I can't show a firearm uh, during a live event, I wish I could use showing you the overall length case gauge. But with that said, check out uh, check out. Make sure I don't get nailed here for copyright. Check out where is it? Check out part three, the second half of reloading, which wasn't live, so I could show the firearm. And I actually show you how to use an overall length case bullet comparator going off Ojive. And I got it in here somewhere. Yep, right here. So I can't show this to you live because I'd like to show you using a firearm, but I can't. So check out part two, which isn't live. And I show you how to use these tools in regards to seating the bullet in regards to Ojive. 
Seeding the bullets by OGI will trump going off the tip of the bullet or coal cartridge overall length every single time in regards to accuracy. If you're going for the utmost accuracy of seeing how much that bullet literally jumps, when I say jumps, when you fire that firearm and that propellant ignites and that bullet comes out of the brass casing, it literally jumps through the air, literally. It's a small amount, we're only talking less than an eighth of an inch, but it literally jumps through the air as it exits the brass and hits the rifling's lands. And that's why they call it a jump because it literally jumps through the air. It's very minute, but it still jumps through the air. And most semi-automatics will have a pretty generous jump. And that's why loading to maximum magazine length is fine. Because usually you're gonna have a jump of roughly more than, I don't know, uh, I'm about to show that here to you in a little bit, but probably a little bit less than an eighth of an inch. Um, and a lot of manufacturers play that jump safe because they wanna make sure regardless of the ammunition that you put in there that that bullet's secant radius, when I say the secant radius, that this part of the bullet doesn't touch the rifling's lands because sometimes when that bullet's secant ra radius actually touches the rifling's lands or even gets gouged into the rifling's lands, the velocities and the pressure exponentially go north. And it's very, very dangerous if you don't know what you're doing, especially if you're playing with the high side of the powder drop. And more times than not, it's not an issue with a semi-automatic, but with that being said, my old AR-10 LMT modern weapon system, I extensively reloaded for that. And all bullets that I used when reloading to maximum magazine length, the bullet secant radius never even came close to the rifling lands other than one bullet. I did find one bullet that not only was it touching the lands, but it was gouged into the lands and that was the Sierra Match Game Kings. And you gotta be careful of those Game Kings. They have a very aggressive secant radius to them. And if I didn't check that bullet when I first initially got the firearm, when I first initially started reloading for it, that bullet would have got gouged in the lands and those pressures would have exponentially spiked and it would have been dangerous. And I'm glad I checked it. And even reloading to maximum magazine length, I was gouged into the lands and I had to set them way back off of maximum magazine length. And it's, it's really important that you at least initially double check that. And that's exactly what I did in part three. And I show you how to use these tools and what Ojive is and taking the headspace gauge out of the body and inserting your bullet comparator into the body and how to use this together with your overall length case gauge based off the bullets ogive. I can't show that to you because there's a particular way of showing you how to use these and I have to use the firearm in order to do that and I can't do that live. So check out part three of this series and it goes into great detail on that. Um, but that will always trump going off the tip of the bullet or measuring by coal. Now, I know for a fact from part three here that measuring off the ogive and I'm restricted to magazine length that I think the jump was a little less than an eighth of an inch. So regardless what I do, just to get the round in the magazine that I know for a fact I gotta get the round, I gotta seat the bullet deep enough so it sits in the magazine. I can't go past it, obviously, it's a semi-automatic. And going by maximum magazine length, that I know for a fact I'm not gonna be remotely close to those rifling lands. I'm gonna be well off of them. So it's kind of a mood issue when it comes to semi-automatic, but you definitely still need to check it if you start out with a new firearm or if you start with a different bullet. If you start with a completely different bullet, you're definitely gonna wanna double check that. Now that's with a semi-automatic. Now this completely changes with the bolt action. Bolt actions you can single feed, so that's nice. Plus most bolt actions have a bigger box magazine so you can see that bullet out further to play around with those, that, those jumps. And a lot of firearms that are bolt actions that I have, something like my Tika T3X CTR and 308, I can definitely play around with those jumps and I can actually touch and gouge the bullet into the rifling lands. 
And usually if I'm gonna start, once I hone down my powder drop, I get the harmonics set just right. Um, I will start playing with the jumps a little bit, not too much if I really wanna deep dive deep into the low development world. And I usually would start with a 20 thousandths of an inch jump. And I will usually work my way up to touching the lands. I never gouge my bullets. I know some guys do, but I don't. And then I'll see how that affects my accuracy. And if that doesn't improve my accuracy, sometimes I will back that jump off from 20 thousandths of an inch. And some firearms love a great amount of jump. Some firearms don't. It just depends on the firearm and you just got to test it out. I know a lot of Remingtons and Weatherbees, they love a tremendous bullet jump. And it's just something you got to test out and play around with. So um, let me check out your live feed here. The chance. Now I know I see some of you guys are talking about crimp and I've already gone over this quite a bit, but if you're new and you haven't seen my previous videos, I'm just gonna quickly touch base with this. I don't crimp, never have crimp, most likely never will crimp. I will crimp on hunting rounds and if I do crimp, it's a very light kiss of a crimp. Um, but I kind of went over that already in the previous live video event. So uh, let's see what else we got here. Uh, So the Thor is actually saying, just to know, I like that Todd puts out this information in a friendly way. Some people out there have the school teacher mentality. Like there will be a test afterwards. <laughs> yeah. There'll be no tests here, man. I'm just spreading my knowledge. I'm just trying to help you guys out. Uh, so I think that's pretty much it. So I'm gonna seat some of these bullets here. I'm gonna get you a little bit closer. Back this up so you guys can actually see your comments. <clears throat> now I reset this, I backed this seating stem out quite a bit so I'm sure this is barely gonna get uh, seated. And like I said, I'm just gonna reload the maximum magazine length which I've already got that information from the, the uh, reloading series which is 2.247 and if I check out the latest data, you can see here that they're recommending a cartridge overall length. Now, I'd recommend going off Ojive, but at this point we're totally safe with using coal. And I wanna get the most amount of, uh, or least amount of jump possible. Uh, their recommended coal is 2.245 and which just to get this round into the magazine, I found out with an ample amount of room so it's not close, claustrophobic in there, is 2.247. So it's pretty much the same thing. I'm just gonna be reloading to recommended coal. And that's what recommended coal is. Whatever the manufacturer recommends, that's exactly what I'm pretty much gonna do. Um, All right, so let's uh, seat this bullet and I'm gonna try and get this bullet straight up and down as straight as possible. And this is where I, if you, if you noticed, when I was doing the headspace, I'm gonna try and get this press handle in the picture here. When I was doing headspace, I was over camming and the second it overcammed and stopped, I stopped. I didn't press down on the press handle. Now, when it comes to seating the bullet, it's completely different. I, you never overcam. And that's where I do give a good ample amount of pressure down at the bottom end. I wanna make sure there's no wiggle room there. And this bullet is probably not gonna be remotely close to what I'm shooting for. And let's make sure that our Calipers are reading true, like I said in the previous section. So I got this one piece of brass I know is exactly 1.750 inches long. So get that in the camera. So we're gonna make sure that our calipers, the battery's not going dead. 
And exactly that. So we know for a fact it's 1.75 ohm. Batteries are not going down. My calipers are reading true. Set this off to the side. And our recommended coal for the manufacturer was 2.245. We're going 247. And we got a ways to go. We're at 323. So I got a ways to go. So we're just going to keep on playing around with this until we reach that number. And this is something you don't want to go super fast down on. If you go too fast or if you got too much neck tension, if you see a ring where the stem interacts with the O jive, so where the stem of the die comes in contact with the O jive or secant radius of the bullet, if you start to see a ring developing around that bullet that means the stem is literally denting the copper jacket and if you see that it is instantly going to destroy the accuracy of that round that means a couple things the first culprit is most likely too much neck tension your neck tension is way north so if you're using a, a Resize and die that's neck only, you probably ought to re readjust that. That's probably the first culprit. The other thing is you just need to clean your die. And I can't stress it enough, you need to make sure that your dies are always clean before you use them. Um, so we got a ways to go here. Uh, we need a number of 247, and we're at 302, so we're getting close. Like I said, I'm going nice and slow, putting an ample amount of pressure at the bottom stroke of that handle. So we're at 2292. Two so we got a ways to go. And this is where having something like a Redding competition die seater roller really comes into play that you can actually see how much you're adjusting this. Being that this doesn't have a readout on the seater, I kind of got to play around with this until I reach that magic number. So we're getting close, 283. And I just don't want to overshoot this. And I can actually hear that powder compressing now. So 271. We need 247. Just don't want to overshoot this, at least when you're initially setting up your cedar die. So we need 247. We're getting close. 260. So I'm going to start finally adjusting this until we reach that magic number 247. So 256. So I'm actually going to. We're not there yet, but I'm going to put this in the magazine and you're going to see that we're not quite there yet. You know, this might just clear and man, oh man, does it just barely clear. I mean, we were talking that tip is just scraping that magazine. And man, that's definitely not comfortable. You need a little bit of wiggle, wiggle room in there. And I would say not a full eighth of an inch. You know, you might be able to get away with, you know, three sixty-fourths or something. You know, about an eighth of an inch is adequate, but you want to keep an eye on that suggested coal cartridge overall length that's in your manual too. So usually it's going to be right around there. And manufacturers know that when they're making the firearms in their magazines. So, so I'm going to carefully strip this off so I don't scratch scrape that bullet and we need 247 and we are at 256 now when I get close to this if I'm going off coal cartridge overall length that means you're going off the tip of the bullet well a lot of tips of the bullet especially if there's something like a boat tail hollow point are very very inconsistent uh, bullets that have ballistic tips are going to be a lot more accurate in regards to going off cartridge overall length if you have something more like a boat tail hollow point, let me show you what that looks like if you're new to the game. Boat tail hollow points don't have a ballistic tip. 
They're exactly that. They have a hollow point. And man, oh man, are these ever inconsistent. And if you're going off cartridge overall length, and that's why if you're going using a bolt action, you're going to want to go off the secant radius or the old jive using a bullet comparator. That's where that's really going to shine. But for some automatic, usually I'm just going for maximum magazine length. You're going off the tip of the bullet. And these bolt tail hollow points comparison to something like a ballista tip can be all over the place. They're very inconsistent. You can see the tips of these bolt tail hollow points are not exactly precise, but they do, they do put a hollow point on these match grade bullets. They're trying to reduce the weight on the front of the bullet and keep that weight in the back of the bullet with the bolt tail and that improves its accuracy. Um, and when you're using a ballistic tip, it'll, you'll get a lot more precise readings and you'll see that if you're new to the game over a period of time, you will notice, let's see where we're at here, that you'll get much more consistent readings with a ballistic tip. So we're at 256 and when I get close to that number of 247, when I get close to that, roughly about 250, I'm actually not gonna seat it all the way home. I'm actually gonna pull another piece and see how that one seats in, relate, in relation to the, uh, the first one. So 256, so I'm gonna screw this down ever so slightly. All right, so we're at 253. I'm actually gonna pull another piece of brass here. I'm gonna seat another one. Before I confirm that cartridge overall length, I just wanna compare another one to it. Because sometimes you can overshoot it because you're going off the tip of the bullet or coal. I'm actually gonna make sure I really get a solid downstroke on that handle. And that's also 253. This one here is 253. So we're getting close. I'm gonna actually grab another one so you can see going off at least these ballistic tips, they're very consistent. Now, if this was boat tail hollow point, that would not be the case. Trust me on that. Let's see what this one comes out to. So the other ones are 253. Now you can see this one is off. It's 250. It's off three thousandths of an inch. So being that this one came out less, I'm actually, to make sure that it fits in the magazine, I'm gonna grab the one that was more of 3 thousandths of an inch and I'm gonna finalize my seating with that. And we only need to go 3 thousandths of an inch or 6 thousandths of an inch on this one because this was 253. We need 247. <clears throat> and once, so now this one's down to 250, we're getting close. We only need 3 thousandths of an inch. And right there, my friends, 247. This other one that was identical, I'm gonna seat that, make sure it's at 247. Exactly, 247. And remember, this one was 3 thousandths of an inch, so I guarantee that this one will be 3 thousandths of an inch, because I'm more concerned about getting it in the magazine. So this will probably be, I'm gonna, I haven't measured this yet. This will probably be 244, really close, 245. And that's how you set up your die. Now, if I stick with this load forever, I don't touch that die now. For the rest of these cartridges, I don't touch it. And I'm gonna grab another one, and I'm gonna just double check this one, and then we're just gonna give her hell and seat the rest. And this is where Eagle Eye Shooting was mentioning bullet concentricity. And it's very important if you, this one's also 245. I'm gonna grab one more and that'll be the last one I measure, at least for you guys. Now I can hear that powder compressing. 247. So 
you might see some variances if you're going off coal because of those bullet tips. Don't let that drive you crazy. You're like, man, oh my God, every single one's not exactly 247. You're going off coal. The tips of the bullets aren't perfect. So keep that in mind. So once you get it remotely close, lock it down. Don't touch it. Don't try and chase that exact 247. If you one's 245, you're like, oh my God, I got to decrease it now. And then you put one in and it's off 2000. And then you lower it back down. You're screwing around with the ogive seating depth. You want to set it and forget it once you get it remotely close, just like I've shown you. Now, with that said, if you're going off ogive and you're really fine tuning that jump, especially something for like a bolt action, and you want to make sure that you're meeting the jump requirements of your previous reloading session, then that's where you need to start use, using this a bullet comparator. And it is so, so important, my friends, if you're going for the utmost accuracy. And it all comes together. And I, I hope this helps you guys out. Hit and Steel CA, thank you so much for the super chat. That helps out. And he's saying, we got lots of love for the elf. <laughs> I uh, greatly appreciate that. The elf, Elster's Mad Scientist is here to help you guys out. So let me read some of your comments here. I appreciate that. Hit and steal CA that helps out so much. Um, let's see how far back do I have to go here? Make sure I don't forget or miss anyone's comments. Um, ba -ba -ba. So Eagle Eye Shooting, he's mentioning it's easy to exceed factory ammo velocity. Um, it, very easy. You got to be careful, especially if you start seeing blown primers. Your primers start to blow. You want to definitely check for overpressuring signs overpressure signs would be like cratered primers crater primers i might have example of crater primers in here maybe um, maybe not i think most most of the most of this uh by the way i would definitely get a bad bass brass bin i I uh, recycle all my brass and you get even more money back. And there's a ton of brass in here. And once I get about 40 pounds of bad brass, I recycle that. I usually get a couple $20 bills to dump back into reloading. Um, but overpressure signs would be something like crater primers, ejector swipes, um, ejector marks. Uh, those are things that you definitely want to keep an eye on um, if you're new to the game here. Uh, ba -ba -ba. See, make sure I'm not missing anyone's comments or questions. Uh, so yeah, if we're getting close to the end here, my friends. If you got any questions, make sure you let them rip or anything in reloading. Ask it now because this is the very last episode of this live event. Um, Wow, thank you so much for those uh, super chats, guys. And I, I really hope you guys in, enjoy this uh, live reloading series. Good old Jeff Calvert's dropping down the $5 super chat. That helps out so much. Cam Cam, he's dropping down the super chat. Thanks, Elster. Stay safe, everyone. Man, I really appreciate that, guys. I hope you guys are learning something. Uh, not, not only that, uh, not only that I'm hoping that you're learning something, but you're going to spread this infectious knowledge that I'm giving you guys to the next generation, your kids, because that is truly how we are going to protect our rights. It's not, your vote only goes so far for two to four years until someone outvotes you. And the only way that you guys are going to protect this reloading community and this environment and your second amendment and all that, that matters to you and me is spreading this knowledge to the next generation. So please do that. Gates Jr. Reloading is dropping down the super chat again. Blow it my way. I'm playing, I'll play a kiss there, man. I was at sound. I appreciate that super chat. Um, and uh, yeah, so I, that is pretty much it. And right when you seat that bullet, I'm going to see one last one here. And another thing you can do. Let me see if you guys can hear this uh, powder compressing on this. So this is Varget and it's the bullet is actually compressing or compacting down that Varget and I'm gonna see if you guys can hear this on the audio here. So I'm gonna get my uh, lapel as close as I can.
Can you guys hear that Vargit compressing, the actual powder compressing? And you can run into that while. And if you do hear that powder crunching, that compression sound, you gotta be careful because more times than not, your velocities uh, and, velo and pressures are gonna start going north. I'm gonna quick measure this. And this one is a little over 249. And I'm gonna make sure that this one easily clears the mag. It still does. Actually, I'm gonna load up a couple of these just to make sure that this clears. And it does. So I'm gonna be careful stripping these out so I don't scratch that bullet. And if you ever load up around and you're like, man, I did I put powder in that? You can actually shake this next to your ear. Now this is compressed, so you probably won't hear it, but if it's not compressed, you can actually hear that powder shaking in there. So you don't have to pull that bullet. That's a good example of um, if you have powder or not. So I think this pretty much wraps up this live event. I hope you guys really enjoyed this. Um, I'm gonna just double check, make sure there's no other questions here. And thank you so much for your super chats, guys. Man, it, it really helps with the incentive to keep this going too, because I'm telling you the good old YT, no joke, probably demonetizes half of my videos. And I, I'll keep on doing this regardless because I want to spread that knowledge. And hopefully you guys spread that knowledge on too. Um, <laughs> One cent short for hats off. <laughs> uh, all right, so I think that's pretty much it. So I'm going to do the rest of this uh, off camera. And the next video, I'm not sure when that will be, but it'll probably be very soon. It might even be tomorrow. I'm not even sure. But it's going to be shooting this very reloaded ammunition out at the new private range. And man, is that ever going to be a treat. I wish I could do that live, but I can't. So I'll do a nice, perfectly edited, <laughs> edited Elster's typical video for you guys. And uh, if you guys have any questions, let them rip right now. Otherwise, I'm going to shut this down. This will be the end of this live event. And I will add this to, if you guys are just joining us, you're a little late to the game, uh, check out that playlist area. Um, I started a whole new playlist just for this series and it's right here i'll bring it up here for you guys uh, so if you miss this series i got this all saved in its own separate playlist and we are up to part eight now i'll add that here to the playlist and then once we shoot these reloads That'll be the ninth part, which will not be live. And we can see how accurate this ammunition is, or at least how accurate my shooting is too. <laughs> I've said this before, I'll say it again. It's 33% firearm, 33% reloads, and it's 33 point, well, I should say 33.33% you. And it all comes together in regards to those three, consistency of how you shoot and the consistency of your reloads. Well, don't forget to subscribe, like, and share. Hit that notification bell. And also do me a favor and jump over to Elster's Minute Americans and subscribe there. And I eventually want to turn that channel into exactly this. I don't know why this won't work, but check out Elster's Minute Americans, search for it in the search bar. And that's exactly what that channel is going to become once I get a certain subscriber base. Because right now I can't go mobile live on that channel until I get those numbers up. And I'm shooting for about a thousand to start that. Once I hit a thousand, that's exactly what that Elster's Minute Americans is going to become. It's going to come exactly this, where we can learn even more together. And I'm also going to do podcasts on there. I'm going to have many, many uh, knowledgeable guests on there that know more than myself that we can all learn together and that's going to be awesome so like i said don't forget to subscribe like and share hit that notification bell become a patreon helps out more than you know and thank you again for the super chats that helps out tremendously and i will see you guys in the next video when we shoot this ammunition take it easy